anyone do not have problem set one. I hope you submit the solution sheet in next Thursday. Okay? Everyone is okay next Thursday. Next Thursday. Okay? Everyone is okay with it? And I will give you two more problem set before the end of the semester. And of course, the solution sheet is considered as a one criteria for the uh, grading. And also, I will usually I pick up half of the problem, half of the question in final examination. I will pick from the uh, problem set. So I hope you uh, work hard with this, OK? <clears throat> Any question with it? For example, if the number of questions in final examination is 10, then I will pick up five problem from the uh, problem set, OK? OK, <coughs> let's cl uh, start class. Uh, in previous class, we have run the, some basics of the diffusion in terms of the thermodynamics. And we have run how the spin order decomposition happens and I will finalize the diffusion class with the uh, introduction of the some high diffusivity paths. As you know, for the diffusion of the interstitial as well as the substitutional term, it needs some distortion of the lattice for the migration of that atom. So. Considering the defect in the structure is more open structure than the a perfect lattice, it can be easily guessed that uh, those kind of defect structure provide somewhat advantage for the migration of the atom. So those kind of defect are grand boundary and dislocations and something like that. And as you can see in this figure, when the when we consider two one uh, diffusion bond, then the A atom will diffuse into the region of the B rich region. And in that case, the grain boundary or the dislocation inside of the this opposite part will give a uh, high diffusivity pass for the atom A. Here, I collect some <coughs> activation energy for the self-diffusion in various materials. And as you can see, this S is self-diffusivity, and C is core which means the, the diffusion along the dislocation core and the boundary diffusion coefficient. And as you can see, most of the case, the activation energy for the diffusion is far less when the diffusion occurs through the dislocation or the grain boundary. And you have to remember that this activation energy terms Activation and its terms appears in the, the exponential term. So this much of the decrease in activation energy quite 
accelerate the diffusion of the uh, atoms inside of the lattice. But what you have to bear in mind when you consider the high diffusivity path is the relative dimension. Let's see that this is a imaginary grain, and this is grain inside, and this is grain boundary. Of course, the diffusion along the grain boundary is far faster than the diffusion along the lattice, but you have to remember that the dimension of the grain boundary is far less than when we compare it to the dimension of the grain itself. So when you consider the flux by this amount of the uh, concentration gradient, the flux itself is far larger when we consider the diffusion along the border because the diffusivity, diffusion coefficient along the grain boundary is far more, far larger than the diffusivity <coughs> through the lattice. But apparent flux, apparent flux is a weighted average from the contribution from the boundary and lattice. Then what will be the weighting factor? The magnitude of the relative dimension will be the weighting factor. So when we consider the diameter of the uh, grain the diameter of grain is D and the thickness of grain boundary is delta. Then the contribution of each flux to the apparent flux has to be multiplied by its relative weighting factor. <coughs> Okay, so when we put this J1 and B, uh, JL and JB into this equation, and we finally obtain this one, and this will be the apparent diffusivity. Consists of lattice diffusion and the high diffusion path, such as grain boundary and dislocation. So, when we consider the absolute diffusivity of the boundary and the lattice, of course the diffusivity of the boundary is far larger than the diffusivity of the lattice. But when we consider the weighting factor, the relative dimension, the contribution from the boundary diffusion will drastically drop and there will be some crossover. And you can see at higher temperatures than this crossover, <coughs> the contribution of the lattice diffusion is dominant. But when the temperature is decreased with uh, decrease compared to these critical temperatures, then the contribution from the high diffusion fast pass will dominate. Of course, the, the temperature, critical temperature, is uh, dependent on the material itself. <coughs> okay? Usually, the grain boundary or dislocation 
provide high diffusion pass, but that is not the uh, how can I say? It, it does not uh, occurs in when you consider the diffusion of the interstitial atom. In particular, the diffusion of the hydrogen. For the diffusion of uh, the, because the interaction energy between the hydrogen and the dislocation is quite strong. So they want to exist together. So when the hydrogen is diffused into the dislocation, and it is very difficult for hydrogen for diffuse out from its atmosphere because the interaction energy between them is quite strong. So this is the potential energy of the hydrogen and without any defect, the potential energy of hydrogen inside of the lattice will some periodic shape. So at one position, it is stable, and when it migrates to another interstitial site, it has to overcome the interaction and, uh, activation energy, and then there is a periodic condition of the activation energy. When there is no defect, such as dislocation. But when there is a defect, like dislocation, there is a deep wall in the activation energy because the combination of the hydrogen and dislocation can decrease the potential of the hydrogen. In this case, there is much higher activation energy is required for hydrogen diffuse out from that kind of defect. So we call this phenomena as trapping. Hydrogen is trapped into defect. There is many kinds of trapping sites for the hydrogen inside of the material. And that is quite important when we consider the phenomena such as delayed fracture. What is delayed fracture? Delayed fracture is, as the words say, is delayed fracture. When we, uh, for example, when we deformed, formed, forming the sheet and make some part. And at first it was sound and it looks good. But as time goes, there is a cracking. And those delayed cracking is considered to be caused by the diffusion of hydrogen into some vulnerable site for the initiation of the cracking. So in terms of the delayed fractures, those kind of diffusion of hydrogen is very critical and we have to prevent the diffusion of hydrogen in stressed condition. At that case, we usually use trapping of the hydrogen. Inside of the material, we classify the trapping site one as diffusible hydrogen, one as indiffusible hydrogen. Diffusible hydrogen means that the hydrogen trapped but can diffuse when there is sufficient activation energy. The hydrogen trapped in indiffusible site is hydrogen is trapped and it cannot move under usual circumstance, circumstance and usual temperatures. So for the prevention of the delayed 
fractures, we have to put some uh, some trapping side for the for the hydrogen not to move during the uh, during the service, and those kind of immobile trapping site is uh, some kind of uh, interface between the matrix and the carbide. For example, vanadium carbide and titanium carbide. Such a interface between the lattice and carbide provide some immobile trapping site for the hydrogen. Anyway, let's return to our talk. And it, because there is a strong interaction between hydrogen and defect, when the material contains high, high density of dislocation, it definitely decelerates the diffusion of the hydrogen. So for example, when we have two materials and one is very clean and one is filled with uh, dislocation and when it consists the diffusion of hydrogen, then we can guess the diffusion of hydrogen is slower in material which have higher dislocation density. So usually those kind of dislocation and grain boundary provide high diffusion paths, but that is not the case for the diffusion of the interstitial atom, in particular hydrogen. This is experimental apparatus for the evaluation of the diffusivity of hydrogen. Actually, this is apparatus to measure the, to do a permeation test. What is the permeation? Permeation means that when the atom go through the material. So this is the, our sample, and there is, in these two cells, there is a potential gradient. So at first hydrogen go into this side and go through the sample and go out this. So by measuring the time for hydrogen permeation, we can evaluate the relative diffusivity of the material. So this is the, some experimental result. If there is no defect inside of the materials, this will be expected permeation curve. And the shorter time for formation will fast diffusion, right? So if there is no defect structures, the formation is quite fast. But Actual permeation time is quite slow. It means that the defect structure inside the material definitely decelerate the diffusion of hydrogen. And then you repeat the permeation test, then it gradually, the permeation time is gradually decreased, but saturate at certain time. Why it saturate? Why it decrease at first and then saturate? You have to remember that we have two trapping sites. One is diffusible, the other is non-diffusible. In the first run, during the permeation of the hydrogen, both diffusible and non-diffusible site is filled with hydrogen. And by repeating the formation test, at certain stage, all of non-diffusible site 
is filled with hydrogen. Then the remaining is non-diffusible site. So when all the uh, diffusible site, when all the non-diffusible site is filled with hydrogen, then the permeation curve will saturate it. Okay? So we can guess this much of difference is comes from hydrogen trapping in diffusible site, diffusible trapping site. Okay? Okay, then I'd like to move to <coughs> a new subject, which is called uh, nucleation theory in this place. Beside of the spinoidal decomposition, in every Page transformation process, we need a nucleation. Of course, there is no such kind of process in spinoidal decomposition, but except it, we need, we all need nucleation process for the uh, page transformation. So uh, it is quite important process, but Frankly speaking, it is very, very difficult to experimentally observe or confirm the nucleation process because the dimension of the critical nucleus is really small. And sometimes the nucleic process occurs very fast. So it will be very difficult to experimental observation uh, observe experimentally the nucleation process. But there is some theory on the nucleation uh, to describe the nucleation process and we will handle the, there is uh, uh, many kinds of theory, but the standard theory is classical nucleation theory derived by uh, who? I forgot. Baker and Dorin. So there's two things you have to remember when you consider the nucleation. One is it is stochastic phenomena. What is stochastic? It is a matter of problem, a uh, problem, not probability. You have to think about the probability of the uh, nucleation. And second is there is always increase of free energy at very initial stage of the nucleation because even though we have advantage in volumetric free energy, but for the nucleation, there will be a contribution from the surface. The contribution from the surface is from proportional to the square of the radius. The advantage from the volumetric free energy is proportional to the Q of the radius. So there is always some critical point 
or the nucleus should come over. In this class, we will handle so-called classical nucleation theory. And there is two important assumptions. One is the composition inside of the nucleus is always the same. And second one is the interfacial energy between the nucleus and the matrix is constant. But frankly speaking, both of the assumption is not valid. In particular, the second one. You usually know there is some orientation relationship between the product phase and the growth phase. Why there is a, those kind of specific orientation relationship between two phase? to minimize interface energy. And usually the nucleus is surrounded by some low energy plane. And the interface energy associated with that low energy plane is quite different position to position. So usually the constant interface energy assumption is not valid, but for the derivation of the uh, steady state nucleation rate, anyway, we have to assume these two statements. And the final equation we have to derive is this form. This is steady state nucleation rate, and the steady state nucleation rate is given by the product of atomic number of atomic nucleation site and frequency factors and gel dubity factors and some exponential term of the activation energy for nucleation. This is what the classical nucleation theory says to you on the nucleation rate in uh, steady state. So from now we will drive how this equation comes from. Before starting the derivation of the mathematical terms, let's consider Again, the two terms contribute to the nucleation. One is volumetric free energy change. And one is disadvantage from the interface between the nucleus and matrix. As I told you, the volumetric gain of the free energy is proportional to the Q of the radius, so it goes down rapidly, right? But this advantage from the interface is proportional to the square of the radius. This goes with n, and the summation of these two terms, so the free energy of the nucleus with respect to radius or the number of atom inside of the cluster or embryo or nucleus will go this upward properly. So you already know this height indicate the activation energy for the nucleation. So the nucleus or embryo should overcome this amount of energy barrier to become a real nucleus. So let's think about the thermal fluctuation. 
what is the amount of thermal fluctuation for one atom. When temperature T, the, thermal, the amount of thermal fluctuation is given by KT, right? So this means when the radius of the cluster do not reach this amount, then those kind of cluster will, will not have chance to become a nucleus by thermal activation. At least the size of cluster reaches this, then there is a hope to become a nucleus by assistant of the thermal fluctuation. In the same way, when the size of the cluster reaches this critical size, then there is always there is a chance for the cluster will dissolve into the matrix by thermal fluctuation. Only when the size of the cluster is larger than this critical size, then it will become a stable nucleus. Right? So we can say the cluster smaller than this critical radius is always exist as an embryo. And the cluster larger than this critical size, it always become a stable nucleus. Okay? Okay, bearing that issue in mind, then we move for the derivation of the uh, steady state nucleation rate. For those kind of mathematical treatment, we have to define some terminology. Here, CN, we consider the cluster of monomer, dimer, and cluster with three atom, four, five, six, and n atom. And here, n is the number of atom in the cluster, and Cn is number of cluster with n atom. Similarly, n plus in one is the number of atom in the cluster, and Cn plus 1 is the number of cluster with uh, consisting of n plus 1 atom. Okay? So, let me define the frequency factors. Here, beta n is a rate at which single atom is absorbed by uh, embryo of size n. It is equivalent for this cluster become this n plus one cluster. And alpha n plus one is defined by the rate at which the single atom leaves an embryo of size n plus one. So that is equivalent for the chance for this cluster to become n cluster. Okay? So, then I would like to 
I would like to write down the net flux of embryo of size n to become a size n plus 1. The net flux will This is the number of <coughs> this is the flux of this n embryo to become n plus one, and this is the flux of this cluster to become this one. So net flux will be given by this one, right? To evaluate the relationship between B n and alpha n, let's assume the imaginary equilibrium state of this distribution of the cluster. What the equilibrium means? There is no flux, right? So in imaginary equilibrium, true. So we can write down. Here, not means the concentration of the cluster at imaginary, imaginary equilibrium state, right? So this is appearing next slide. So by assumption of the equilibrium state, so we can derive this equation and then we can eliminate alpha n1 in the original equation by inserting this one right and then by put out this this one and this one out and we can obtain this formula this is kind of simple Okay. And the tongue inside of this can be written down uh, with uh, the first derivative of with respect to the n, right? And finally, we can obtain this form and put this one into the original equation and finally, we can obtain this kind of uh, formulation. <coughs> okay? No difficulty so far. Everyone clear? So our final goal is to evaluate the, any problem? No. Our final goal is to evaluate the steady state nucleation rate. So what is the meaning of the steady state? 
the meaning of steady state is the state is not dependent on time. So for the state, uh, sta uh, for the independency from the time, you can easily understand all CN value should be independent of time, which means that all flux J1, J2, J3, and Jn should be equivalent. If there is any disturbance in the flux, will automatically change the state. So it is not a steady state. To obtain the steady state, this flux should be the same in any time. Right? So let's see the flux at the critical nucleation size as J star. And you can convert this formula into this one. It's a very simple one. And what we have to do is to integrate this equation to obtain J star. Right? J star is the flux, that flux of critical nucleus to become the next step. So this is nucleation rate at steady state. That is what we want to derive in final form, right? So by integrating this form, we can obtain J star. So how we can integrate it? The range of N is from where to where? From, from where to where? Be brave. Zero to infinity. Mm. Consider what is the n. n is the number of the atom in the cluster. So it should be 1, 2, infinite, right? The integration interval for n should be 1, 2, infinite. Then we have to evaluate how this, <coughs> how the interval, integration interval of this variable, cn divided by cn naught. Cn is number of cluster with an atom. And Cn naught is number of cluster with an atom in equilibrium state, imaginary equilibrium state. If I say the conclusion first, then the distribution of CN naught is given by this solid line. And here CN naught is C1 naught exponential minus delta G, GN naught 
divided by kt. Gn naught is activation energy, a uh, free energy to form the cluster of with an atom. How we evaluate, how we derive this one. How we can derive. I wrote down, not forget it. Here, C and not is number of cluster with an atom under imaginary equilibrium. To evaluate this CN naught with this form, let's consider the serial reaction to form of the cluster with an atom. Here, at first, if we consider A atom, to Constructing to construct the dimer, these two A atoms should be combined, right? And similar expression So when we add up this serial expression here, this is the summation of this serial expression, right? So when we consider the equilibrium constant K, with these two direction and the equilibrium constant will be what? This is typical uh, formula when you run, you may run the elementary chemical introduction to chemi chemistry class in the undergraduate school, right? And when we write down this as a concentration, this will be So the concentration of the monomer is far larger than the concentration of the cluster with an atom. So this can be simplified with this form. 
from the bunch of isotherm okay and this is So when you consider one atom, there are then one mole of atom. This is one mole of atom, and when you consider one mole of atom, this brain energy change will and finally you can get this form. Anyway, the important thing is that the concentration of the imaginary in the imaginary equilibrium, the concentration of the cluster is given by this downward formula. Downward probability with from the equation of this one. So you have to remember this is a imaginary equilibrium of the cluster. But in the real situation, as I told you, the cluster with a size less than this critical value have no chance to become a nucleus. The cluster larger than this critical value always grown up, already gr grown up into the stable nucleus. So when we count the real number of the cluster, when the cluster size is less than this value, it will be equivalent to the ideal distribution of the cluster in equilibrium. But when we count the cluster size with size larger than this value, already there is no cluster with that size because all of the cluster become a stable nucleus. So you can see, you have to understand that the real number of the cluster will deviate from the equilibrium condition at this point and gradually decrease and go to zero when the cluster size reach to this critical value. I understand it is quite difficult to, to understand the first time, so uh, it needs some time for you to observe the concept of the imaginary distribution of the cluster in equilibrium state and real situation. So I upload the relevant material for your, uh, for, for, to help your understanding, so please read it at once and it will be helpful for you to understand the concept of the classical integration theory. Okay? So I will continue in next time and any question? No? Okay, then see you in next time. Okay, as I mentioned, as I announced that the, the class will start at 9 o'clock in 
coming Thursday. Okay.